This will be the blood covenant, part 13. Got my numbers right today. And I'm going to give you the last paragraph that we finished up last week, kind of the summation of a Christian life. And it's summed up as the consciousness that He lives within us. And we draw upon His infinite life in every situation we find ourselves in. This means as we grow in Christ and mature, that we have a sense of our own weakness so that we might no longer trust in ourselves. And in that, to the proportion we don't trust in ourselves, we live from His strength. Now that's amazing. And there is a scripture, I don't know if I can find it here, um, but uses those very words, and it may be in, yeah, uh, Romans 12 and verse 6. Having then gifts different according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And of course, you know, we've been talking about faith and what that faith is, faith as an object. And, and to the proportion of faith, meaning how much are we resting in God? Are we resting in our own strength? Or are we resting in Him and His finished work? You know, just... But Paul went through a time of great pressure. He learned the lesson of knowing his weakness that Christ may be his life and strength. It was a lesson that Paul had to go through. And it's right here in 2 Corinthians 12. I want to look at it. Starting in verse 7. least I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Now, I've heard a lot of debates on this thorn in the flesh, what it was. And we could go debate that all day long, but if he wanted us to know what the thorn in the flesh was, he would have told us. It's irrelevant. What, what is relevant is what he did with the thorn in the flesh. Because we all got a thorn in the flesh. I guess that's a nice way of, a Greek, a Greek way of saying a pain in the beehive. Thorn in the flesh. But here with Paul, this was a trying time. I mean, you got to think about it. This wasn't just a... something small. This was a messenger of Satan sent to drive a stake in his side. This was no small trial. You know what I mean? I mean, you ever think about that? This, this was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him, to discomfort him, to make him uh, in agony. And in prayer, he begged God three times to take it away. Now, that's a Hebrewism for over and over and over. It wasn't just I prayed three times and that was it. You know, that was just, that was a Hebrewism. But his prayer was answered, but in an unexpected way. The thorn wasn't taken away. But it became the situation in which Paul learned the reality of that Christ lives in him. But see, we don't want all those things. But this is how Paul learned that Christ lives in him. 
in the Amplified, in verse 9, and he said, My grace is sufficient for thee, my strength is made perfect in weakness. The Amplified says, My strength and power are made perfect or fulfilled and completed and show themselves most effective in your weakness. Now, this trouble that Paul is going through here, it drained him of all faith and expectancy in his own strength. Have you ever been in that situation where you're drained? And how many times did the Lord bring Israel to the place, you know, uh, you know, of course, I, I just go right straight to the Red Sea. I go right straight to Egypt. I mean, how are they going to get out of here, the most powerful nation in the world? There's no, you don't even have one spear, one sword. How are you going to get out of Egypt? Now he leads them down into the valley and breaks them to the Red Sea. I mean, how in the world are you going to get through the Red Sea? Coming into the promised land, this land that's, they got horses and chariots. There's thousands upon thousands of them. And plus, the River Jordan is flooded this time of year. We ain't got a boat. We ain't, there's no bridges. How in the world? We, you see, every time he brings them to the, to the place that this is not your strength. This is not your wisdom. And if you keep trying to rely on it, I'm going to have to bring you into a place to where it's going to be not effective. It's not going to work here. And then doing that to Paul here... It made Paul a perfect vehicle to express the strength of Christ. And isn't that what this all is all about anyway? And I know for myself, and this is uh, completely against everything that we've been taught, but, and, I, and I just speak for myself, I, I find my trouble is pride. Because it's hard to come to the place to acknowledge your helplessness. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, we're taught to, oh, we can do it, we can do anything, you know. And, and I think that's a, sort of the difference in, in Christian doctrine today. I, yes, we're conquerors, and yes, we're overcomers, and all that in Christ, but it's His strength. It's not me trying harder or believing harder or anything. I must come to the point of I have no strength. I have no wisdom. I have no ability. You know. So to, for us to come to the place of our acknowledged helplessness, pride keeps us from us. And, and I was looking at this verse here Look in, in 1 John 2. Start at verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And, and this word world here is cosmos. And cosmos means orderly arrangement. You, you guys know that. That's the, I could say it this way. Love not the status quo. This is the way things are. The status quo. If any man love the, the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and here it is, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. You remember back in John when he said, you are not, you know, you are of your Father, the devil. If you are of Abraham said you would go about to do the deeds of Abraham, but instead you go about to kill me. And he says this, and, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. Everything that is with the world, that orderly arrangement, passeth away. And how did it pass away? For Paul, a thorn in the flesh brought him to the end of this thing. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now you remember last week we talked about the abiding. 
And you remember the, the branch abides in the vine. And you remember what we were talking about, how that means that how we abide is that he is ever present with us. That's how we abide. So Paul had to learn the fact that Christ is always present with him. His strength is always available. His wisdom, his righteousness, his healing, his everything is always available to him. So abiding in the will of God, which is Christ Jesus himself. And this goes right back to religion, and I know we've all had our part in that. We don't really believe we're weak because everybody said we're strong. Listen, we're never going to come into the place where we're strong in and of ourselves. We're the vessel. We're the weak vessel. He's always going to be God. We're always going to be his people. We're going to be the vehicle for his strength to be made manifest, and that only through our utter weakness. But if we bring that over into religion, we believe that, that if we try harder, we can please God. You know. And our prayers are really, uh, or, or, or not really, rarely expressions of our total weakness. Because how do we pray most of the time? And I know I can go back and look. We want God to help us, do we not? By strengthening our strength. Lord, I'm weak in this situation. If you could just give me the strength. With str you know what I mean? Strengthen me. To help us where we fall short. But Christ's life can only be seen in and through us at the point of our utter weakness. Our utter inability. Our utter Jordan is flooded. How in the world are we going to get through it? You know? Our utter, we have no money. How is the Lord going to give us this land? We have no money. How are you going to start a school? You know, I, there's a little mailbox down there at the road. I never checked in it, but sometimes I think, should we start checking that mail to see if somebody sent some money up here? You know, to check that thing. Go check it out. But, you know, it's got to be in the Lord because we don't have it. We don't have it. Everything that's taken place up here has been that way. I mean, we're not, you know, it's just the way it is. And in and understanding that now, you think about this. I gotta go back to that verse. The pressures that make us really face our weakness, now they can be looked at as blessings. Now, see, that's not. I mean, that you could thank God for those thorn in the flesh. Paul rejoiced in his infirmities. I mean, he said, most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities. Paul didn't go around and say, here's how I'm going to glory. I'm going to glory because I was a Pharisee of Pharisees, raised up in the meal. I'm the smartest Pharisee there ever was. I speak two languages. I speak, well, actually, I speak three languages. I speak Hebrew. I speak Greek. I speak Latin. You know, I speak all these languages. I'm the man. I'm going to glory that I know nothing save Jesus Christ and him crucified. But I want you to look that the power of Christ may rest upon me, he says. That, that, that little phrase right there, rest upon me, that, that's descriptive of being engulfed. It's, it's uh, out of sight. It means it inside something. The Amplified says, may pitch a tent over a dwell. This is the very, I mean, Paul preached out of the Old Testament. You, you know that. So this is none other, he got this from Psalms where he said, in the shadow of his wings. You re remember that? that? That I would be engulfed. I would be completely hidden. No strength of me is going to be seen here. That he may pitch a tent over and dwell. That kind of, that's something. Now, let me keep my place here. 
course, you know, we got to go over to Philippians and look at that. I mean, here is these famous verses that's quoted everywhere. Philippians 4, starting at verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I'm instructed both to be full, to be hungry, both to abound, to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now notice what he says, I have learned. Paul had to learn this, so why should we think we shouldn't have to learn it? Paul learned this, and I, I just gather he was referring back to the thorn in the flesh he wrote in 2 Corinthians 12. When this little phrase here, it means this. Paul's, Paul is saying, I have been initiated into a secret. Here's the secret. This, the world don't know this secret. It seems foolish to the world. But for Paul, being brought into total weakness introduced him to the secret of handling every situation life could throw at him. He learned the, the secret of being content. Now, how many Christian people do you know are content in every situation? Now, this word content here means to be sufficient. To be possessed of sufficient strength. To be enough for a thing. And you know, this had nothing to do with Paul's willpower or his own strength or his own upbringing. For Paul, it was Christ in him. Christ liveth in me. And that, and that word strengthen, uh, what he says right here, strengthen. I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. It, it means strengthen. It, it means to infuse with strength. Now this is where things where sometimes people get messed up because you know we, we've talked about this but you know you guys ever make tea and you know you boil your water and you take the tea bag and put it in you remember mom used to make that and, and the tea bag would be in the water and the little string would be hanging over and then the whole water becomes infused with the tea. And after it's all saturated, you know, the tea bag, you don't drink the tea bag. The tea bag is still separate, but the strength of the tea comes out into the water. So much so that it cannot even be separated. But yet, we don't become him, and he doesn't become me, yet he fuses my empty life with his rich, eternal life that the world may taste of him through me. They may drink the tea. Right here's a verse, uh, Colossians 1 and 11, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Strengthen. Now this word here, <coughs> it's a form of dunamis, which, which you guys, you know, we've went over that word. It means potential power. And this word all might is another form of the word dunamis. And it says, according to his glorious power. Now that word there is uh, kratos, and that's the almighty power of God. Strengthened with almighty according to. That, that phrase according to means in line with. Let me give you an example of in line with. Guys, uh, I don't know if this has ever happened to you before, but you know you go to a motel or go to some building. You know, I was just down at the hospital, so I had to go up, get on the elevator, go up 
whatever floor, you go up to the fourth floor. Well, the fourth floor is up here and I'm down here. I get into the elevator. The elevator takes me up. Once the floors become aligned, the door opens and I step out onto another floor as if the floors are the same. See, that's according with, in line with. Have you ever been on one that stops a little short, you know, and you know, things ain't exactly right? But this one is according with, to bring to the same level. It, what it's saying here is that the in strengthening with all power that we receive is in line with the almighty power of God. And this is the covenant union that we're speaking about. Now, some say, okay, you're talking about all this power here, so let's go do some miracles. Isn't that what, bro? You got all this power, let's go do some miracles. Well, the miracles he's speaking of is revealed right here in this verse. Look what he says. Strengthen with all might, according in line with, to his glorious power. Now, here comes the miracles. Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. All patience. Patience towards all circumstances and people. Who would try your patience more than anybody? People, circumstances. Christ is in us to live in and as us, bringing the almighty power of his life to everything and to everyone we have to deal with in every circumstance. You see what I mean? So Paul could, could joy in his infirmity saying, I don't know what to do in this situation. You know, Christ, this is yours. This, I mean, this is, we're talking covenant here. This is all part of his, his covenant and our, our union with him. Now we know that the Holy Spirit brings us to the covenant. We talked about that last week and makes us partakers of it. But our relationship to the Spirit, it, it can't stop there. He works in us continually to make every detail of the covenant a functional reality in our lives. But we must ask, now I'm kind of looking at this thing from a prayer side, but we must ask confidently for what is ours and confidently Look to the Spirit to bring it to pass. Now see, always there's those other scriptures that come to pass. You, the reason you ask not, or you ask and receive not, you ask amiss, to consume it on your own lust. But look at all these things he's talking about. He's talking about in every situation, because our mind goes to, well, Lord, I'm asking you for these giant miracles, and what's he saying? With long suffering, with patience and joy, and, and all these little circumstances, the these everyday little life things. See, we think the Holy Spirit's only active on Sundays or on Wednesdays, but we can't believe that he's... I mean, have you ever been in a situation, and I know, it seems like when I'm in a hurry, and really there's no need for us to be in a hurry, but you know, sometimes you just get into a hurry, and I have to go to Walmart to pick up something. And I get into the line where the lady up ahead of me wants to coupon. Or write a check. Or, you know, go do food stamps or something. So you're in that. And you know what? They could be 13 lines open and I get behind the coupon lady every single time. So, and look, and I know these things sound trivial and you guys know what I'm talking about. But it's in those little everyday mundane patience, long suffering, and joy. Maybe Christ wants to reveal himself. I mean, these two people are talking up there. They're having a good time. I'm the one that's upset about it. So we... And that's the reason I'm talking about with, with 
Paul, uh, Paul said I was initiated into the secret of being content in every situation, you know. He wasn't talking about when he come up just against the Red Sea or, or any of those things. He's talking about in every little mundane thing in life. How many of those circumstances arise every single day? So we, we must ask confidently because it's part of the covenant union. Look into the spirit to bring it to pass. Look, look at this prayer that Paul prays right here in Ephesians 3. For this cause, I'm in verse 14, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according, in line with, you, you got, see, there's that word again, in line with, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might how? By his spirit in the inner man. Do you realize what I'm saying here? Now think about this. His strength and his power. You're down here all the day and he's up here. But according to his riches, something had to get me up here on this level. Now I grant you, we've been brought right here to the, it's not my strength. He is, because when he rose again, he carried us with him. So it's according in line with his riches and glory. His strength. That we may be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Now listen, he's talking to believers here. He's talking to the Ephesians who have Christ in there. But now we use the term by faith. And what is faith? Faith has an object that you may be able to see and have focus. And remember, we're back to this proportionately. That you may be rooted and grounded in love. May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, height. And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even think. According to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, where without end. Amen. This prayer is based on the fact that a covenant has been made. He's praying that they might know their real union with Christ. Then he takes them back to the source that they might know in their experience the love of Christ. That's why he says rooted and grounded in love. Rooted like a, like a plant draws its strength from the ground. You take that plant out of the ground, it'll be withered up in 30 minutes. But this thing is rooted. In other words, all its minerals and strength and energy is coming from the ground. It says rooted and grounded. And grounded here, it, it's, it's uh, building uh, in its foundation. And what is that foundation? Love. And he brings us to the ultimate goal of the covenant. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God, that your hearts would be flooded, that his love would be shed abroad in our hearts. I mean, how in the world could such a prayer be answered? This thing seems like wow, don't it? I mean, if you really read it, it seems like a wow. How in the world could this be answered? How can, how can Paul is praying a prayer here that's outside the realm of our thoughts? I mean, you see, above all that we're even able to think, he says. How, 
God's going to answer a prayer that we can't even think. How in the world could this be? How is it going to be? According. He says right there again in, in verse 20. According. In line with the power that worketh we're at in us. And we know that is by the Holy Spirit. The language of the covenant, it's translated into our daily life, becomes our real world by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. The Spirit joins us to Him in such a, a union that it's described as the relationship of head and body. I'll go back over here to, to Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12. I want people to understand that this, this is the final reality of our identity. Listen to this. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, bond free, we've all been made to drink into one spirit. I'm just going to skip down to verse 27. He doesn't say some glad day. He doesn't say one of these days. He doesn't say after you do this or do that. He says now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Now most Christians, I mean They define Christianity as, I had my sins forgiven. But the New Testament speaks of a forgiveness. Yeah. But it can't be separated from our being made one with Him. It's, it's never to be thought of as, as something being separate. Remember Romans 5, the... the the disobedience of one is brought all into sin, but yet the obedience of one is brought all that believe into righteousness. And then you remember what Paul says? Uh, what shall we say then in Romans 6? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? I mean, he's saying, the, the, how can you, I mean, we're, we're in, in Christ, we're in his death, we're in his resurrection. I mean, know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? I mean, Christ is our invisible head in the heavens. Get this picture. Christ is our invisible head in the heavens. We are his visible body expressing his will on the earth. That's why we can say we're seated with him in heavenly places. Because where the head is, the body is. But the believer is not Christ. And Christ is not the believer. He's the living, ascended, glorified Lord distinct from and objective to the believer. Yet, by the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, the two become a functional one. And we know that head and body share the same history, don't they? I mean, I you know, I can't look back at my history and say, oh, I remember when my arm went to went to the lake. I remember when my arm went up. I remember when, you know, I remember when my leg. Everything my head experienced, so has my body. Because they're joined. Now this, this is just so important. 
I never knew this, guys. This may be new. This may be old stuff to you, but it's new to me because it was always a separation. Always. And even if he was dwelling with me, I was just up to my next sin. And then he couldn't depart in, in a temple. I knew I was a temple, but oh, I've defiled the temple. Now he's got to leave, right? But this new covenant, we abide in him. He abides in us. So Christ died. Remember, his history is our history. In, and in his death, he overcame sin and death and, and the devil and the grave. And now he lives in the power of an endless life. And we are literally joined to him. It's not some phantom imagination. We are literally joined to him. His history is our history. His history was by the obedience of one. Many are made righteous. His death was our death. We can't say, I am crucified with Christ. And we can't say, I walk in newness of life. The same power that raised Jesus up from the dead now lives in us. And it's that power that strengthens us. We're alive. I said this before, but we're alive in two worlds at the same time. We view our world from our union with Christ, partakers of the divine nature. Remember I said we're in the world, we're not of the world. We looked at that. Over there in 1 John. Head and body. Each of the members of that body. They share equally in the same state. If the head is rich. Remember his riches in glory. Then the body's rich. Right? I mean. We don't even think about that with our natural body. We don't even give it a consideration. I mean, he doesn't live in the enjoy the heavenly riches and live in glory in the heavenly realm while we live in poverty locked into a material world. Head and body are joined. That you might know, be rooted in grace. I mean, you guys know these verses, uh, I mean, but after you see them in covenant, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ and hath raised us up together made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ to be in the new covenant is to be a part of a community that lives day by day in the heavenly realm in a literal spiritual locality that is in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the spiritual. And we are in him. He's in us. We are in him. He's the spiritual. Now back over here in Romans. Let me, let me go back to that. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ. Were baptized into his death. Therefore were buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Paul is writing a letter to the Romans. And in these verses, he's speaking to them of what happened to them at their baptism. The beginning of their Christian life. He's not talking to them, and this is, I think, where people get messed up. He's not talking to them of an experience beyond baptism. Or a second blessing. There's only one baptism. I can go show you that. 
He's not talking about something else. He's referring them back. He said, know ye not? He's, he's not saying to these Romans that this thing here is something to be prayed about or sought after, but he is stating something that is a true state of being of every believer in Christ. Don't you know you were baptized into Christ's death? And just as Christ died and rose again, you rose to walk in newness of life. That is your state of being. That is how you began in this Christian life. Don't you know that? Why are you praying for something you already got? Paul is reminding them of their status as believers. And what constitutes the basic facts of their faith in Christ and the most basic fact of who they now are as believers is that they are in Christ joined to him united to Christ they share his history they are now sharing his life I wish somebody would have told me that 30 years ago I never knew the Holy Spirit dwelt in me I thought he just paid us a visit blessed us and out of here and I'm left to struggle through you know this is Paul is saying this is something that is you're joined to him and you build your life and your behavior around that what do I mean my life and my behavior I began to realize my helplessness in every situation you know, like Denise told me one time, I may set my clock at 6 in the morning, but I'm going to pray before I go to bed. Lord, if you don't wake me up, I ain't putting my trust in this clock. My trust is in Him. He knows. <laughs> many, many Christians, and I did, and probably you did too, we, we live in the frustration of trying to arrive at where we already are. It's like being told to sit down when you're already sat. And somebody's standing, oh, you're all okay. I said, sit down. I'm already sat. I said, sit down. I'm already sat down. You, you see? Now, this was something that we had a hard time getting a hold of, too, because, and, and even up here in this, we're, we're told that we got to be crucified with Christ. We're told that we got to die with Christ. We don't realize that, my God, you were already dead. You were dead before you even knew you were dead. I mean, you know, without going into that whole thing, that was the judgment that he came and he pronounced all dead in trespasses and sin. Therefore, grace could be extended to all. I mean, knowing that we are one with the living Christ, his body on the earth, that's the missing factor in the experience of most Christians. They're taught to think God is up there or down here. Or sometimes in the church, and these things filter through, sometimes in the church we say God was really here today. God really touched me today. And I know what they mean. You do too. And there are special moments when the presence of the Lord is felt more than others, like we had some. But we've expanded that meaning. And we bring it into our everyday definitions of God, in, in which at best we believe that God is beside us. Right? Now, now this is something, and I, and I know we even talked about this last week, and we... And we think, and the pictures look so good that God has carried me. I'm in a troubled time, and he's carried me. No, he is living in. He's the very life that's in you. He's not outside of you. He's in you. Now, see, this is something the, the world out there, even Christian artists, haven't gotten the picture of. Their picture is, he's walking beside of me. And that's not it. You're his body. I mean, where is your life? Your life is in your body. 
Your life is not walking. You know, there was a movie out. I can't think of what it was. The Golden Compass. That's it. It just came to me. I don't know if you guys seen it. It's kind of a, a child movie, but in this movie, they're in an alternate world, and their soul doesn't live in their bodies. And their soul is an animal that follows them around. One soul may be a bear. One soul may be a monkey. One soul may be a cat. You know, so you got all these kids, and their little animal follows them around. Well, that's our picture uh, that Jesus is the one, and he follows us around. You know, if we have a little bit of Christian doctrine, we think that. Some are just, well, he's a million miles away. And for those, I mean, for me, that, that was me. He was so far away. We got a calling from some distant heaven to solve the current problem that I have. And he's, he's the specialist that would call in to solve the problem. And as soon as he solves the problem, he heads back. Problem solved. Now, you know. And I was always the one who always stopped. I know the Lord got me out of this mess, but it ain't been 15 minutes and I'm in another one. You know, he ain't even made it back, so I'll give him a few days to get back and get rested up, and, and then I'll call him again, and we'll just try, you know. Our minds do that. I mean, they really do, because we don't realize that he's in me, that that mighty power, that strength, and according has brought us, and he... And see, none of that is, is New Testament at all. New Testament was, they knew that he was in them. They, they worshipped him and, and they prayed to him as, as objective to them at the right hand of, of the Father. But at the same time, they knew through the Spirit that they were united to him as one. And there's a lot of these expressions, I forget how I many, 200 sometimes it's used in the New Testament, in Christ. In the Lord, in the Spirit, in Him. See, we are immediately present to Him. And He is, get this, immediately present to us. He is our atmosphere. And I know there's a whole sermon here uh, about the mist that went up to water the earth. <coughs> I know there is. I can't see much of it, but that was the, their atmosphere, wasn't it? Their atmosphere was that of relationship with the Father. Now you think about that. They walked in that mist. Because when Noah built the ark, it had never rained. But yet the earth was watered. So Christ is our atmosphere. He's our very life. And, and you know what, guys? I mean, just... Just think naturally so. What if you left this atmosphere? You would die immediately. I mean, you go to outer space, take off your helmet, you implode. And I tell you what, when I realized that I didn't have to try and crucify myself, I didn't have to try and die because, you know, the whole time you're worried about, oh, I'm alive, and now I've got to face this cross. Oh, Lord, it's going to be rough, and I don't really want to, and i got to cross the bear. And when we're trying to do that, we just feel more alive to self. Every thing in us rises up. But the beginning of faith was to realize that I had already been included into the covenant and to him who is the covenant he lives in me as my very life my problem was that my faith was looking to the future for something to happen to me you know instead of biblical faith which was looking back to his death burial and resurrection and rested in the fact that I was there. I mean, do we get that? If I be lifted up. I mean, do we get that? So 
So a New Testament believer is one who looks at the at the whole world through the reality that I am in Christ. All life is understood and accomplished because we are in Christ. Re remember what he says here in this verse that we've quoted 10,000 times? If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of, the, of God, set not your affection on things above, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So we don't live by rules, regulations, and laws. We live by His presence in us. He, he dictates our lives from within, just like He did Paul and Peter. He dictates from within. We have, we have to learn to live in Christ. What's Paul's thorn in the flesh? He was learning to live out from another strength that wasn't his. I know most when they become a Christian, they, they, they call it a struggle. I mean, it is, you start to grow up a little bit, what do you start doing? Well, I need to discipline my life. I need to start reading more. I need to, you know what I mean? I need to do. We start bringing in a discipline as to what we think a good Christian should be, whatever that standard is. We do spiritual exercises. We paint our faces with a smile and we go to church and we got it all together, man. My life is great. Since Jesus came into my life, my world is tulips and daisies. What a bunch of junk. I mean, really. I mean, the Christians come in with this confession. They say, oh, Jesus died and rose again to save me from sin and death and hell, and I made him Lord of my life, and now I'm going out to serve him. Right? I mean, isn't that the, pretty well the standard thing? I got saved, now I got to serve him. Now, what does that really mean? Now I got to start paying back the great debt that I owe. So then it just becomes... A great labor. The truth here is Christ, uh, our representative man, made a covenant with the Father as me and for me. His obedience was as me. It's his obedience. And I was included into that. I thought I had to be obedient and, and go out and die and pick up my cross and but yet, he obeyed as me. He died as me. He rose again, taking me with him. It's not me trying to obey and failing, but of trusting in his obedience, trusting in his death for me. I know I've told you this before, but I really realized that I was crucified with Christ. I was driving down the road from Charlotte to Columbia, and I about wrecked my truck. I realized, my God. I don't have to hide from him when I see him coming down the aisle. Understanding that he did something apart from me. Because that's what I thought. He loaned me some money. You know what I mean? He paid a debt for me. And now every time I see him, I see him as a debtor. We died as one. I mean, when I really got a hold of that, I thought, my God. I was included in that debt. I don't know anybody anything. And he carried me with him in his ascension to the Father. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. He stands there in the presence of God and I'm in him and he's in me. We're standing in the very presence of the Father. See, most Christians look, look or, or they work toward that, that something that would happen that, you know, and they're working backwards. Trying to achieve what has already been done. Yeah. Don't you know, Paul says? 
It, it, I mean, this is why Paul is saying, don't you know? Let's get back to the starting point and move from the starting point of life. When I, when I see this, guys, I was baptized. I was like 13 or 14 years old. But still, but now today, I look back at my baptism. To, at that time, it didn't mean that much to me. As years went on, it meant even less. But now it's becoming a lie. That was a point. You, you see what I mean? I look back and I think, my God, I, now I'm beginning to see what happened 40 years ago. I understand that it, that it was the physical expression of my faith in his action. See, I always thought of my relationship with God as being between me and God. And you know, that's very shaky. That's very conditional. But how free it is to know that my relationship to God was based on and dependent upon Jesus who was acting on my behalf. And if that's fact, if that's true, our relationship to God then is as strong as that of Jesus to the Father. I tell you that that, that we should be united to Christ, his body living by his life, is it, that's the wisdom and the mystery that Paul spoke of that had been hidden since the foundation of the world, but is now revealed to us by his spirit. I mean, look at this verse. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world and to our glory. And then here it goes, eyes not seen, ears not heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have, we've not received the spirit of the status quo, this cosmos, this, this age, but we have received the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. See, apart from the enlightenment of the Spirit, the truth's more than we can bear. We can't, we can't, you know, as Jack Nixon said, you can't handle the truth. But us being united to Jesus, we've been granted to share in the love relationship of the Trinity. As the Father loves the Son, so He loves us, for we are in Him. We share His glory, and, and there are no more... We are no more of the world than he is. Here, uh, John 17. Listen to this. <clears throat> that they may be one. I mean, verse 21. As thou, Father, art in me, I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. That they may be one, even as we are one. The glory thou gavest to me, I gave to them. <coughs> I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me. And hast loved them as thou hast loved me. I mean, do you get that? I mean, some of the verses you just got to stop and just stay there a few minutes and let the Holy Spirit just don't read it too bad. <laughs> that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Now, how did he love the Son? God so loved the world, he gave the Son to the world. The Son went into the death and rose again. Now he lives by that power. 
You know, he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. So there's some joy that's set before you. That you might bear fruit. Now, I'll just say this and I'll get out of the way. Many believers, they, they come to faith and then are only later baptized. And then even later experience the fullness of the Spirit. In the early church, entrance into Christ was at baptism. Coming up out of the water, being filled with the Holy Spirit. But God loves us and He's merciful to us even in our ignorance. Thank God for that. Even if we wasn't baptized right or in the right water or in the right way, who knows, but he's, he's merciful to us in our ignorance, right? I look back on it. I don't need to be rebaptized, baptized but now I'm rejoicing in the fact of what took place there all those years ago. So let's not be shy. Let's not present our unbelief as humility. All he is... All he has won, all his authority on earth is made manifest in us and through us. He is now our sphere, our atmosphere. He faces life in and through us. He responds to the challenge of the age in us and by us. And we face it in and through his life every day circumstance in everything. That's the reason I think you know we used to talk about these things called bylaws and, and we always said I, I know the world is is governed by this one thing and all the rules and all their court cases they look up and they say let me get this off the shelf and they say oh and uh 1974, we got uh, Gibson versus the state of Virginia. Here it was. Here was the law. So past practice means here's how we're going to do it. Ain't you glad that's not the way it is here? That he lives every circumstance in us and through us and his strength and his wisdom and his righteousness, his Life, his love flows through us to a hungry world. And that's why Paul said, Therefore I rejoice, I glory in my infirmities. So. Uh -huh.